Hello dear students, uh, I am Dr. Zubair Shanib Bhatt. I welcome you all to this first uh, online class for AOC second year and an initiative taken by our Honorable Director Skims and uh, orders received from our uh, principal of uh, PMC that is the Paramedical College. Uh, this will be the first of the class uh, that will be followed by a series of classes in order to compensate for the loss you have incurred during the lockdown. So. The topic of my talk today will be harmful effects of microorganisms. So let's begin. So we are talking here about, let's start with an introduction. Okay. So when you talk about being a uh, paramedical student, we will talk mainly, we'll focus our discussion on this. That will be, uh, I mean to say, the medical microbiology. So microbiology means a study of microscopic organisms and organism biology stands for the life. So it will be a study of the uh, small organisms that are not visible to the naked eye. And uh, we are, if we fuse the two terms medical microbiology, so you will be dealing with particularly the pathogenic microorganisms that are affecting the humans. And they are of a very small size and microscopic range that is around say around uh, that will be around say 10 to the power minus 6 but some of them are also visible some of them are also visible some of them are also visible uh, uh, from the naked eye like parasites you can see them with a visible eye and uh, second important thing is uh, that is, is the techniques and the culture that is involved in microbiology. So you should know about the different techniques of uh, vis uh, visualizing these microbes and then the techniques involved in culturing them. And that will be beneficial for you uh, in the particular field of diagnosis. And then when you diagnose it, then uh, we, we as a doctors can uh, start a treatment about it. Now, uh, what do microbiologists usually do? They work as researchers and uh, they can uh, act as teachers, which I am here. I am also have worked as a researcher. And uh, you can use it in the clinics and uh, per particularly for the paramedical st uh, staff or you can, uh, we can use that in the industrial settings like uh, different kinds of diagnostic laboratories. So, uh, just uh, not to waste your time, uh, I will simply say that the microorganisms we can divide into four different groups and these major groups are viruses, the bacteria, the bacteria, the fungi and the parasites. So now here if I talk about parasites, uh, they are visible to the most of the parasites if you think about they can be visible but still they are included in the microorganisms. Now talking about first the viruses. okay. So what are viruses? Viruses are uh, differentiated based on their presence of nucleic acid. Either they have R nucleic acid, that is ribose nucleic acid, or they have deoxy, DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. So uh, the viruses can either contain RNA or a DNA as a genetic material, but not both at the same time. They can also be differentiated on the basis of the lipid envelope they have. Some of them have and some of them don't have. So uh, if you talk about uh, say around the currently uh, uh, famous topic of uh, that is uh, coronavirus. So the, it is it is an it is an RNA virus and it has a lipid coat around it. Okay. So this is one example of the uh, RNA containing virus. The second example of RNA containing virus is HIV. That is human immunodeficiency virus, and it has both of them have an outer coat apart from the. Uh, nucleic acid and the protein cover. Coming to the bacteria, we have two kinds of bacteria. We differentiate them from on the basis of the staining. That is gram staining. We have gram negative bacteria and we have gram positive bacteria. They are prokaryotes. Pro means primitive and karyon means nucleus. It means that they do have a genetic material but it is scattered around the cytoplasm. They don't have a definitive nucleus where the you know the DNA material is squeezed in. They don't have any organelles as well, but they do have some mesosomes as, that act as respiratory chains. They do have 70s ribosomes for the protein synthesis and they have their own replication machinery, which is different from uh, our, our humans, that is, we are eukaryotes. The third class is uh, fungi. Fungi can be single cell, for example, yeast. We have two kinds of yeast, that is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that is the baker's yeast, and we have Saccharomyces pombi. 
and that is the uh, fusion yeast, fission yeast. Then fungi, if, if the, we call them as we have multicell, uh, we call them as molds. You might have seen the molds growing on the bread, which you keep and you forgot uh, in the fridge. So they are they belong to the category of eukaryotes. U means true and karyon means nucleus. So they have a true nucleus. That means all the genetic material is squeezed within this small diameter of one micron. And you can see that around two meters of DNA is coiled and you know squeezed inside this eukaryote because of the presence of the histones, which uh, the prokaryotes don't have. And then we will talk about the fourth one, that's the parasites. They are of again two types: the single cell or called protozoa. The best example of protozoa is Plasmodium falciparum that causes malaria. And uh, then multicelled worms. Worms can be like a flatworm, tapeworm. Or round worms. Then the third category that belongs to the parasites is bugs. So shortly I will uh, tell them the ticks and mites. Okay, mites destroy your furniture, and then mosquitoes and fly, uh, flea, flies that contaminate mosquitoes are responsible for causing malaria or flareses, and uh, uh, these uh, flies can contaminate your uh, food. Then we have lice, which is very rare to find nowadays, and then we also have the fleas. Okay, so going through the next slide. Uh, in this uh, lecture, I am going to talk about focus more on the harm uh, harmful effects of the microbes. Well, let us see. Let us have a compar comparative uh, view about it. So, are microbes uh, harmful or are they beneficial? Uh, what is the percentage of being a beneficial versus the harmful? So, if you talk that, if you talk about human beings, we are teamed with microorganisms. We have the skin microflora. Then we have the uh, cut microflora and then we have the oral cavity so it becomes like uh, you know uh, growing size for the uh, microorganisms so we are microorganisms outside and inside and they are important for human health because uh, in case they are particularly uh, you know beneficial for human beings uh, you will talk about gut microbes so they help us in uh, very digesting various kinds of foods so it's good uh, and it's working good for a, you know for a human well-being uh, but surprisingly you will see that it's less than only seven it's only one percent of the microorganisms that are pathogenic or harmful to us so they have many undesirable undesirable effects and uh, we will uh, come uh, will uh, you know correlate them with as harmful effects of microorganisms so the first one will be the pathogenicity that means we'll talk about different viral diseases, bacterial diseases, uh, diseases caused by the fungi and the parasites. Then second uh, problem that harmful that they are, which is harmful for us is the antibiotic resistance. We have the antibiotics uh, in place for different kinds of microorganisms, but uh, they start showing resistance to the already existing uh, drugs. So we have to look for the new drugs. So it is a big problem for us to deal with there. So then we'll be talking about cancers. Uh, Cancers are of different kinds and in a simple term I would say it's an uncontrolled division of cells. Then it also there is a problem these microbes can destroy or host human uh, defenses particularly the HIV and the HTLV1 and HTLV2 which we'll be talking shortly after this. The microorganisms are also responsible for food spoilage and which is particularly uh, most of them are I mean uh, they, were, they are at low temperatures, they can grow and they can even destroy the food that we store in the fridges. So it is also responsible for uh, our food poisoning which can be very threatening uh, at some times. And the last one will be about the biological warfare. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So uh, what is pathogenicity? So uh, and how can we define a pathogen? So any uh, microorganism, whether it's virus, whether it's bacteria or whether it is whether it is a fine or protozoa so these are all the microorganisms and if they infect a human host and that will affect either a part of its body or it can affect uh, the whole body of the individual or it can squeeze some toxins that are you know destructive destructive for us that is for example endotoxins and exotoxins so these kinds of organisms we call them as pathogens so if, if you go by the dictionary definition patho means uh, disease and gen means generated so they are disease uh, producing microorganisms and this ability of these microorganisms to produce a disease is called their pathogenicity so, so some microbes have 
uh, fairly low pathogenicity and some have high. Now, because we are talking about diseases here that are caused by the microbes, so we will be shortly talking about these four kinds of microorg uh, microorganisms that cause human diseases. Okay, going to the next slide now. So first we'll talk about the viral uh, viral, and uh, viral diseases because viruses uh, being, we will start from the small size, they are of the dimensions of the nanometers, and then um, bacteria and then fine J and particularly we'll go to the larger size of the uh, parasites. So the first viral pathogen was uh, that was studied to cause a disease was called tobacco mosaic virus. And this tobacco mo mosaic virus was affecting the tobacco industry because this virus was causing yellowing of the uh, leaves of the tobacco plant. So this was the first virus, uh, viral disease, virus that was being studied. And when you talk about the outbreaks, you, viruses are very, you know, uh, they are very infamous for causing outbreaks of various different kinds of viral diseases. And uh, they can be epidemic, that means they can be localized to a particular area or a country. And if it be becomes epidemic all around the world, we use the term pandemic. So there are different kinds of pandemics that has occurred throughout the history. So I will briefly talk about a few of them. Uh, in 1918, uh, the Spanish flu uh, took place, which was caused by a virus called as influenza A virus. It was pandemic and uh, it, uh, it almost, uh, you know, it almost killed around 100 million people. And that constitutes around uh, roughly around 5% of the uh, world human population. And, uh, you know, actually it just wiped out 75% of the uh, population from the Europe. So it is very pathogenic, uh, I can say. And then, uh, but surprisingly, in contrast to the, your current outbreak, that is uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, this Spanish flu was affecting the human healthy young adults. Okay. So that was a very different contrast. So people were dying and young people were dying, which are the future of any nation. Then uh, by 1980, there are, you might have also heard about HIV. In HIV is a human immunodeficiency virus. It's an RNA containing virus and it destroys our uh, human T cells, that is CD4 T helper cells. And when it destroys it, uh, we become, you know, our immune system uh, becomes so weak that we can die from any uh, kind of disease, whether it's a viral or bacterial or, a, you know, parasitic or fungal. So it is considered as a pandemic. It's all over the world. And estimatedly, uh, it has been detected that 38.6 uh, million people are, you know, living with HIV. And when HIV, uh, you know, uh, goes further and it takes around... Uh, 20 years for an HIV patient, you know, HIV positive patient to develop some kind of disease called as AIDS, that's acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Now coming to 2020, we have been, you know, uh, highly affected and it hasn't become an alarming situation that we have not been taking, you know, lessons from the earlier, uh, you know, outbreaks. We also have, uh, we have outbreaks of Ebola virus, uh, different kinds of viruses as well. But when we talk about coronavirus, why we name it as coronavirus? Because it's, it is a virus which has a crown, it has, it's a circular virus and uh, it, it has something, a crowny structure on its surface. So that's what we call the corona, means the crown. So you can say it's the king of all the viruses because it has been, uh, it has, it developed severe acute respiratory syndrome in China in 2002. And then it again mutated and um, you know, erupted in the form in Middle East respiratory syndrome, particularly in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 2012. And then now we in 2020, we see it as COVID-19, which again, you know, originated from Wuhan, China. But if you go through the pattern, you will see that in the first case, it, it took 10 years for a strain to develop and mutate. And then within eight years, it has now mutated again, the third time, I mean, the second time. So you will see that uh, you will be surprised to know that uh, this coronavirus uh, is also responsible for your uh, normal common cold. But if it mutates, then we have the problem. So let's uh, briefly talk about this. And uh, because we, we talk we talk so much, there's so much uh, you know uh, news around today about this uh, disease. So let us have a look on it. So coronavirus disease that is COVID-19. So this coronavirus disease that is COVID-19, it's an infectious disease. It means it can spread from one person to another. 
and it was caused by a newly discovered virus in the uh, December of 2019 and we, we, it was named earlier by WHO as novel coronavirus. Then its name was re reframed as SARS coronavirus type 2 by the International Committee of Technology of Viruses. Now, uh, when we talk about COVID-19 virus, it spreads primarily through the droplets, I mean the aerosols. The same is the case with tuberculosis and it can be present in the saliva or the discharge uh, discharge from the nose so why i'm talking about the nose particularly uh, it you know if you if you see a coronavirus and it has their antigens on its surface and then if we have our nostrils here so consider this is your nose okay and when it enters our nose uh, it it enters into the epithelial cells of the nose and then it replicates within these epithelial cells of the nostrils and particularly the nasopharynx. Naso 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 so uh, I, I, I probably think that we should have salt goggles and sniff the salt uh, water from the nose to remove it. It can be a protective measure uh, from my point of view. And then of course using masks, that's good. And then you, you have all the things that washing the hands because, uh, because it's infectious, uh, it can you know stand on the tables and cause and spread from person to person. So particularly you know that uh, the, when the person uh, coughs or sneezes, he produces these droplets and then the, these droplets are, you know, uh, by air, you know, transmitted to the other person. So it has been really, 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 very really dangerous scenario right now. And, but on the other hand, if you look on it, there are cases that in case of the children, and in case of particularly the uh, young adults, it is uh, not you know, so infectious as in case of the elderly uh, patients, as we know that they are older and their immune system is weak. So this is a, in stark uh, you know, contrast to the Spanish flu, which was killing the human healthy, healthy, healthy people. So most of them have uh, recovered from the illness and you can go to the website of WHO or you can go to the John Hopkins University website to see the live updates how many people have still recovered so you should have faith in god faith in allah that uh, you know we will get rid of it so i as i told in contrast spanish flu uh, it is particularly affecting the older people and all other people also which have some underlying medical conditions for example some people have cardiovascular disease some people have diabetes uh, some people have chronic respiratory disease like corporate that is uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder and uh, people who are suffering from any kind of cancer because the chemotherapy you know uh, it lowers our uh, immune response so it can have a serious effect on them so no new vaccine has been developed so far although the outbreaks have been there for a very long time uh, we are unfortunate for it that no vaccine has been developed and there are some ongo ongoing trials because we have to hope we have to have a hope to get away or get rid of this uh, pandemic, inshallah. So there are uh, ongoing trials with different kinds of uh, medicines and different kinds of uh, uh, can, uh, are in a clinical, can, a clinical can be a clinical candidate for as a vaccine for this disease. So now moving to the next uh, slide, we have bacterial diseases. As I told you, based on the gram staining, we have gram negative bacteria and uh, we have gram positive bacteria. So if you can look on this uh, stain, when we stain uh, the microbes with the gram staining, so you will see that uh, the, the pink ones are the gram negative bacteria and the purple ones are the uh, gram positive bacteria. Gram positive bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan layer. So when you wash it uh, with an acid alcohol, the dye doesn't come out. So it, they remain as purple. So now, and in case of gram negative bacteria having a thin peptidoglycan layer, washed with an acid alcohol they uh, they change, change into pink color okay now they are found everywhere gram negative bacteria are found everywhere virtually all around the earth now the good thing about it is the gram negative bacteria is present in our intestine and it is a model organism model organism that was used in research to understand different kinds of processes like uh, replication in prokaryotes uh, transcription translation and uh, regulation of our uh, genes. In case of uh, eukaryotes, the yeast was used as a model organism, that is as a cervicia. So, but at times, 
there are some bacteria which can be pathogenic such as pseudomonas originosa here it can cause uh, you know infection in the burns here you will see that they are pink colored and we also have chlamydia and uh, trichomatis chlamydia uh, particularly causes uh, pneumonia uh, or um, urethritis infection of the urinary genital tract or trachoma the important uh, point about these gram negative bacteria is although they have a thin peptidoglyl layer but they have an outer leaflet that's made up of uh, lipid bilayer same as that of ours okay and they have in this outer membrane they have lps that's lipopolysaccharide and this lipopolysaccharide acts as an endotoxin we call it endo because it you know it comes out when it's being uh, you know this uh, endotoxin comes out and this uh, causes immune response in our body so in gram negative bacteria they also have the ability to they have an efflux pumps that can you know take the antibiotic out of them even because they have a thin layer if anybody comes in they can you know spit out the antibiotic to be in a, to a normal language but if it enters your circulatory system particularly your blood this lps can cause toxic reactions for example it can lead result in a fever increased respiratory rate and low blood pressure and it can be life-threatening we name it as septic shock okay now coming to the gram positive bacteria they are positive because they retain the stain that is gram stain and if you look at it uh, although most of the gram positive bacteria are harmless they are free living saprophytes saprophytes are organisms that uh, do not digest the food inside uh, they screen the enzymes out and uh, let the let it digest outside and then absorb from the environment so some species from all the major groups uh, have been found that they are pathogenic in nature it means they can cause disease particularly the six different uh, gram positive strains which have been of uh, they belong to different genera so they are pathogenic to humans and if you uh, try to you know group them these gram positive bacteria um, can be differentiated as cocos first three that is staphylococcus then streptococcus still if uh, staphylococcus uh, it looks like a bunch of grapes like this streptococcus they're aligned in a straight line cocos means circular and then we have also anterior cocos which are in pairs we call also call them as diplococcus so you will see they cause different kinds of diseases in the stable they cause food poisoning they can cause endocarditis a problem with the heart bronchitis and the toxic shock strepto uh, Cocos, it has been uh, involved in pneumonia, meningitis, and dental caries. Anterior cocos cause and anterior teres. Now, rest of the bacteria, which are not cocos, they are, they are rod shaped, they, we call them as bacillus. So, we have uh, these gram positive bacteria are usually bacillus in structure. So, we have bacillus subtilis, we have bacillus anthrax, and they are spore forming bacteria. So then the third criteria is whether they are spore forming or they are not spore forming. Only the two uh, uh, bacteria listed, three bacteria listed here are non spore forming that is Listeria and uh, Corony bacterium that doesn't cause, they don't produce spores, neither the MTB uh, produces spores, the rest of them uh, produce spores. They are spore forming gram positive bacteria. Their diseases are listed here, we will not talk about in detail. Now the third uh, disease that is being uh, we're talking about is the fungal ones and the uh, fungal uh, diseases are particularly you know they cause infections in your skin. So again uh, the fungi are saprophytic as I told uh, before they screed their enzymes out and digest the things out and then absorb them. So however a really, uh, few relatively few species are pathogenic and they cause infections like allergies and they can particularly I can list here in the table are this one is uh, cutaneous myco my mycosis and the, then candida candidiasis which causes a thrush in the skin as you can see it in this diagram okay now several of them are responsible for mycosis also so this here cutaneous mycosis is caused by uh, trichophyton species so uh, some of them you can see in the table the rest of them you can see in the here Okay, going to the next is the protozoal and parasitic uh, diseases so when we talk about parasites you may think about uh, 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 talk about uh, think about, about a friend you know who always uh, has his fun from your pocket money so you are at loss and he's at gain 
So this is parasitic rela relations of, of microorganisms on host is host, host is always on the losing side. And one of the best examples of a protozoal disease is malaria, which is caused by uh, Plasmodium falciparum and uh, uh, from a single celled protozoa. And flariasis, which causes elephantiasis, uh, it's a multicellular parasite. Now, these are the lists of a uh, few of the protozoal and the parasitic uh, worms. So, one of them is malaria, and one example of uh, is flariasis in case of parasitic worms. So we have here, as you see, the you know, the female uh, mosquito is responsible for your malaria, and uh, we have then different kinds of uh, worms and bugs. A flat worm, atinized solium, can cause uh, cysticercosis if it goes to the brain, and that is responsible for triggering uh, you know seizures in a normal human being. Then we also have round worms, and we have ticks and bugs and fleas. List, okay. Now, going to the second important harmful, uh, you know, nature of these microorganisms is that we have microorganisms and we have antibiotics against them. But with time, what happens is usually a doctor prescribes a medicine, and this medicine has been taken for a particular kind of, of a time. But usually, happens is what happens is uh, people stop taking medicines; they don't complete the course, and that leads to the emergence of antibiotics. So particularly we have been seeing the emergence of multi-drug resistant and it is a very concern for um, uh, medical fraternity because uh, what if uh, no drugs work and we give it to the patients and the drugs stop working at all. So it ha we have to as researchers and as a medical fraternity have to look and we have to avoid and aware the people about this. So, in case of the antibiotic resistance, particularly the, uh, the antibiotic uh, you know, resistance is uh, given to the bacteria by uh, plasmids that contain antibiotic resistant genes. And particularly the r factor plasmids, they have uh, the genes that code for the enzymes and that destroy or modify the antibiotics. The first antibiotic that was developed uh, by Alexander Fleming during World War II was penicillin. And penicillin was active against the uh, cell wall of gram-positive bacteria because it broke the NAM and NAG bonding NAM and NAG bonding in the peptidoglycan layer of the gram-positive bacteria. So it was acting here. And some of the common disease-causing drug resistant bacteria, they include the following. I have shortened it for a few of the species. So one of them is MDR-TB. MDR-TB is multi-drug resistant TB that is uh, resistant to the first uh, two drugs of the uh, uh, chemotherapy that is rifampicin. Rifampicin which causes RNA, binds RNA polymerases and inhibits uh, transcription and second is isoniazid that is a cell wall inhibitor. So we also have antibiotic associated diarrhea that is caused uh, by Clostridium difficult. It is a spore forming gram positive bacteria and it's nosocomial in nature, that is, it's hospital acquired. We have vancomycin. Vancomycin is an antibiotic that also is against the cell walls, and when no antibiotic works, the last option is the vancomycin. So, but still, we have resistant vancomycin resistant enterococci, and then we have MRSA, that is, methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. MRSA, methicillin is also an antibiotic that uh, targets the uh, you know cell wall but if they don't work they become resistant and this staph aureus causes meningitis that is it affects the three meningitis of brain that is pia matter arcanide matter and dura matter from inside out pia matter arcanide matter and dura matter from inside out again then we have a car a carbapenem resistant enterococci which are i told you they are in pairs they are circular in structure and they occur in pairs. So carbapenem is also an antibiotic that affects the cell wall. So there are still we have uh, you know uh, the resistance is developing against this. So vancomycin is being used for the treatment of uh, this MRSA now because it's a last option and it is in a, you know given to the patients by intravenous not oral. It is also uh, given for patients who are suffering from carbapenem resistance, people who have antibiotic associated diarrhea and then uh, talking about the last one, Nazira gonorrhea, which is responsible for a sexually transmitted disease, uh, it causes gonorrhea. So now we have strains which are resistant to this um, antibiotic against this strain. 
So now moving to the next one is cancer. So uh, what is cancer? It is, I will say that in simple words, it's an uncontrollable division of cells. And cancers can be, uh, you know, they can be caused by a different number of factors. And one of them is viruses. The first cancer that was, uh, you know, the first virus that was related to develop a cancer in chicken uh, was a virus. Then it was discovered by Ross. In humans, you know, viruses may bring there are different ways that the you know viruses can cause cancer in our body. So either they can bring oncogenes with them when they infect us, because when they replicate, they can you know the replication can be done with using our machinery and the oncogenes can be incorporated into our, our genome, or they can carry a promoter with them, which will you know uh, that will uh, activate our proto oncogenes and convert them into the oncogenes that's cancer causing genes or there are some other ways you know they can transform our cells into the tumor cells that's cancer so one of the first uh, um, example i can provide you is epstein barr virus it is the best studied human cancer uh, viruses and it causes uh, burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal uh, carcinoma it also leads to the formation of uh, this burkitt's lymphoma is uh, responsible for you know, uh, it's responsible for the um, cancer causing uh, cancer in the jaws, jaws and abdomen, the abdominal area of general. And, and in Western uh, Africa, it is responsible for a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Talking about the hepatitis, that's the cancer uh, of the uh, liver. Hepatitis B is responsible for hepatocellular carcinoma. And hepatitis C is responsible for uh, that is that causes liver cirrhosis can also cause cancer in the liver. Then we have human herpes viruses. Human herpes viruses are usually you know they give cold sores, but um, this is an example of DNA containing virus and HHV8 that is human herpes virus 8 is associated with the development of Kaposi sarcoma that develops in the humans of and it, uh, it causes cancer of the sarcoma that is mesodermal tissues. Then we also have HPV, human papilloma virus, which causes cancer to the opening of the uterus of, that is the cervical cancer in the woman, particularly uh, in both developed as well as uh, developing countries like India. Coming to the human T lymphotropic virus, type 1 and type 2, they can also uh, cause cancer and they can cause adult T cell le leukemia that is a cancer where the cell cells you know uh, divide but they don't you know regain their structure so they become particularly non-functional so they are destroyed so this is what we'll be talking uh, about the next slide so htlv1 causes adult t cell leukemia and htlv2 causes hairy uh, cell leukemia okay now coming to the host destruction this is one example we already talked about htlv1 and htlv2 they destroy our immune cells and here I can talk about that microbes have different ways unique ways you know to enter the human host so either they can evade the immune, uh, evade the immune uh, surveillance system or they can infiltrate in our own you know own uh, cells of the immune uh, immune system particularly the uh, T cells so and destroy them so then first one of the good example of uh, the enzyme, uh, I mean the virus which can destroy our uh, immune system is HIV because it particularly attacks uh, and infiltrates the T helper cells which are responsible for the primary response. So if there are no T helper cells, we also call them as CD4 helper cells, CD4 positive cells. And if the CD4 count drops to below 200, uh, you know, then we can say that with, uh, with a time frame of around 10 to 20 years, a person develops AIDS, that is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay. Coming to the next is mycobacterium tuberculosis. It uses the, you know, the first strategy that it, ev it evades the immune surveillance and it remains within the macrophages once they are, you know, being phagocytosed. And these macrophages, then they have to fuse with the lysosome, but they prevent it from doing that. So they remain within the microsome, uh, sorry, macrophages, and they are not destroyed. Thereby, they, are, they can destroy our immune def uh, defense because this can trigger uh, a severe problem that's called chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation destroys our own tissues. So this is how they can, you know, destroy us and our host defense. Okay, now you. 
you also have to know about the problems when patient comes to you and they talk about uh, different kinds of dysenteries and something so it is because of these microbes they cause something called as food spoilage and particularly because the bacteria are psychotropic that is they can grow at very low temperature uh, and fungus also the molds which, which are you know usually see on the surface of the breads which are kept or forgotten in the fridge they are the major factors for spoilage of the refrigerated foods among the most commonly found spoilage organisms are a number of human pathogens that is pseudomonas Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Clostridium titani, which can cause tetanus, Salmonella typhi, and that can cause typhoid, and Campylobacter and Listeria. Pseudomonads, uh, you know, uh, particularly the C. P. fluorescens, they are involved in the spoilage of refrigerated milk, meat, eggs, seafood, because they grow, grow at 4 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature you have in your fridge. Now, members of the genus of Clostridium are because they are anaerobic, they don't require oxygen, and they are heat. They have a, they, when they form endospores, they are heat resistant, and that's why they can be also responsible for the spoilage of uh, foods that are even canned. That means you will see that a pineapple is comes in the canned form, so they can spoil it still if it is in the can, is in canned form. So another the hello bacteria also uh, salt. Uh, uh, loving bacteria they can grow into the salt and fishes and cause spoilage then we have flavor bacterium they are aerobic free living aquatic forms and but they are also associated with the spoilage of the food now moving to the next slide and talking about food poisoning again the harmful effect of the microbes so although our microbial spoilage you know can merely lead to the food stuff being unpalatable we cannot take them then once they are spoiled because they taste bad but and sometimes it can cause serious problems, particularly food poisoning. So one of the famous bacteria that causes it is Clostridium botanilium. It is a rod-shaped bacteria, okay, and it is a bacillus in structure. So it because it forms endospores, and it this releases a very serious toxin called botulinum toxin, and this causes botulism, food poisoning. We also have Clostridium perfringens that is responsible for gangrene. Gangrene is when your injuries. Uh, don't heal up that's called gangrene so it can cause uh, you know food spoiling food poisoning we have step step uh, aureus staphylococcus aureus which was found to be having you know uh, if MRSA develops they can cause meningitis and this can also be responsible for the spoilage of uh, this, this can also be responsible for the food poisoning you can see them here in the diagram then uh, the fungi particularly uh, they excrete my, my, uh, mycotoxins these are the secondary metabolites they use and they, if consumed by the humans they can cause food poisoning and that can be sometimes very very fatal and coming to the next one uh, I'm running short of time here so the last one I will talk about is the biological warfare particularly called in today's terms as bioterrorism so you, we have talked about the nuclear warfare we have talked about the conventional warfare now the term comes into the place as a bioterrorism which China is also being you know accused of of releasing this uh, coronavirus and if it's uh, if it's proved then they can be you know held responsible for this now we have bacillus anthracis which is a rod shaped bacteria gram positive bacteria it forms spores and these spores call cause pulmonary anthracis so this bacillus anthracis spores they have been used as an agent of bioterrorism and this is causing what we know as biological warfare and uh, there are two good examples in 1979 we used microbes in uh, you know for a bioterrorism and in 2001 that is in the beginning uh, when anthrax spores were you know uh, put it put were put in an envelope and uh, sent to the president of united states <laughs> okay so transmission occurs particularly by inhalation of these uh, once the envelope is opened person person can you know inhale them and it uh, cause is coming from the you know they can be highly fatal but uh, with the prompt insertion if taken then we can have this antibiotic therapy and the survival is possible so uh, dear students this was all about the uh, different kinds of um, harmful effects that the microorganisms are so if i summarize it they can cause diseases okay they can cause cancer they can cause food spoilage they can cause uh, food poisoning and they can be used for the biological warfare thank you for uh, patiently listening to the lecture 
and if you have any comments uh, please uh, give it in the uh, give it in your source in the uh, whatsapp or once i upload it on the youtube you can put their comments also there and if you have any questions definitely you can ask me thank you very much for watching